Hello and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Josh Weiss. And I'm Elijah Weiss. And today we're going to be bringing you, again, three generations of Weisses as we talk about Know Your Purpose and God's Three Rules for Money. We've learned a lot in this series. In the first episode, we learned God's first rule of money, which is that it's never about the money, always about the decision. In last episode, we learned that our call from God is not based on our finances. God will equip us and build us up however He sees fit. Our move on His call is not based on what is in our bank account. So stay tuned as Dad gives us the second rule of uh, God's three rules for money. Welcome back to Crosstalk. I guess I should tell you that I'm not against the use of credit. I'm simply against its use to subvert the will of God or to miss His blessed provision for our needs. So then the obvious question becomes, what if one cannot afford to do what the will of God requires? I would say that when God requires a man or woman to do something, He equips them accordingly. That is why God's money rule number one is so important. I know you remember it. It's never about the money. It's always about the decision. God may not help us accomplish what we want to do, but He will always provide for what He wants us to do. So our faith focus must be knowing with certainty that we are doing His will and not our own. That is why God's money rule, number one, must be repeated one more time. I want you to get it. It's never about the money. It's always about the decision. You see, if we reach a point in our Christian life where the correct choice is not affordable, that is when I think it usually means that two things are required to accomplish the will of the Father. Faith and time. If we're called to make a choice, and that choice requires us to go beyond our means, we need to believe that God will provide and we need to wait for that provision. This often requires more faith than I can muster. But with God, all things are possible. If we preserve and protect the resources that God supplies for His purposes, we won't waste them on our purposes. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. It may be a pillar of fire to guide us through our darkest night or a dry path through a raging river or a red sea. But if we walk in the steps ordered of the Lord, our steps are sure the key is to not become distracted. The same can be said for the provisions of the Lord. A famous pastor that I highly respect has often been quoted as saying that where God guides, He provides. That is one of the most profound things a man or woman of God can learn. But in addition, we also need to learn to use God's provisions in precisely the manner He directs. In other words, the Lord provides what is sufficient for His task, but not always to accommodate for our waste or our misappropriation of His provision. There's a fine author of business books who says that good is the enemy of great. And of course, he's correct. We might never achieve greatness in, in any endeavor. Likewise, if we become distracted with good things in our life, we might not have the time or resources to accomplish the great things that God prefers for His servants. That is why the Lord showed me the second rule. The second money rule of God will always help us obey the first money rule of God when we seek to find and obey the will of God. It is in obeying God's money rule number two that we learn to not waste the resources that God intended for us to achieve His purposes. If we're to walk in faith, we must use God's provisions in precisely the manner He directs. As I said, the Lord provides what is sufficient for His task, but not always to accommodate for our waste or our misappropriation of His provisions. We should not blame God if He gives us what we need and is diluted on what we want instead. We are stewards, not owners. We use God's resources at His discretion, not our own. Thereby, we can be confident that He will equip us 
and provide for what is needed in his service. I'm glad that when Jesus was at Caesarea Philippi with Peter, and the Lord told Peter that he would build his church on that rock, that Jesus kept it simple for Peter. He told Peter to feed his sheep. It is within our capabilities and the will of God for us to feed the sheep. He never expected us to build the church, which would certainly be beyond our capability. That is the job of Christ. This was why Jesus made the commitment to build his church. Do you get it? He would build his church. We feed the sheep. If the Lord provides enough to feed the sheep and we wasted building religious monuments, we cannot impugn the character of God and say that he did not keep his promise. If we do what the Lord asks of us, he will always do his part. If we stay focused on feeding his sheep, Jesus will keep right on building his church. But if we let the sheep starve, don't blame Jesus for our empty, weak, malnourished, confused churches. Jesus will always fulfill his part of the deal. We just can't allow ourselves to get distracted or to waste God's resources on things we have not been called to do. Or worse, God forbid any of his servants heap the treasures of the Lord onto their own stockpiles to bless themselves instead of serving as called. Now, I don't want to focus on greed or disobedience. Those are obvious maladies that don't require comment. It is the error of distraction that robs most of us. It is pursuing good things with the provisions that God intends for great things that can cause us to flounder. This program is a result of realizing that God wanted me to understand that I often allow peripheral issues to hinder my efforts at accomplishing the more urgent, fundamental tasks to which he has called me. Do you fall into this trap too? If so, then you need to talk to my wife. <laughs> she has a great understanding of this concept. It's like house cleaning. If your goals for the day are to clean the bedroom closet and then wash the kitchen floor, there are only two really important things to keep in mind. If your first goal is to clean the closet, then don't clean the bedroom. And number two, in the process of cleaning the closet, don't clutter the bedroom. Both will interfere with accomplishing your stated goals because you may finish the closet, but you'll end up creating a bigger mess and then cleaning the bedroom before you ever get to the kitchen. God explained this to me in terms of his money rule number two. God's money rule number two. Keep the main thing the main thing. Now, most of you may have learned that a long time ago. Nonetheless, this lesson was particularly painful and scary for me. You see, sometimes we get involved in good and intensely spiritual things that can still distract us from the plan of God. It doesn't mean that we're doing anything wrong. It just means that we might be involved in very good things that distract us from the very best things we should be doing. Good really is the enemy of great. I had to learn this the hard way. In my case, recently the Lord put my back against the wall. He sent me into the corner so that I could renew my focus. He wanted to help me keep the main thing the main thing. Now listen, God calls everyone to their own piece of the main thing. And nobody is expected to handle the main thing alone. And everyone, everyone is called to play a very important part in God's plan for achieving the main thing. And that brings me to God's money rule number three. Remember how rule number two pointed us back to and helps us accomplish rule number one? Well, I can tell you that rule number one and rule number two point us to rule number three. But I need to explain the process of how I got there. You see, I begged God to help me understand these matters. And it was pretty crushing to realize that in my busyness, I was not giving God what he wanted and deserved from my life. It should have been obvious, but I was distracted in clear violation of rule number two. I allowed good endeavors to distract me from the main thing. And I was allowing concerns about my weakness or lack of finances to impact our decisions. Of course, that violated God's principle in rule number one. It's never about the money. It's always about the decision. I decided to seek God's will 
for the decisions I faced apart from the financial factors. Likewise, I committed myself to keep the main thing the main thing. But I needed to make sure I knew what the main thing was. I cried out to God. I begged the Lord for wisdom in this matter. What is the main thing? What do you want me to do, Lord? What do you want me to be when I grow up? I'm a grandfather. I'm a brother. I'm a preacher. I'm a professor. I'm a songwriter. I'm a worshiper. I am a I'm an employee, I'm an employer, I'm a citizen, I'm a member, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a debtor, I'm a creditor, I'm a follower, and I'm a leader. Boil it down for me, Lord. What is my purpose in life? Who am I, really? I heard a preacher quote that, I'm not who you think I am. I'm not who I think I am. I am who I think you think I am. This reflection caused me to ask God who he thinks I am. His view is all that really matters. I begged for a response. Lord, who am I and who do you want me to be? What do you want from me? What can I give to you? I was determined to keep the main thing the main thing, and all I needed to do was figure out what the main thing is. I went back and took a hard look at my life and this 50-year-old ministry. I reviewed our mission statement. We are boldly reaching out to change lives with the radical truths of our Jewish Savior. Now, a mission statement helps us focus on the main thing. It helps us evaluate our decisions in light of the purposes to which God has called us and commissioned us to serve. I'm a Jewish guy. I love my people. I love Israel. I love the God of Israel. I want to encourage other people to do the same. I want to help people learn about the Jewish origins of the church. I want to foster understanding about the Jewish festivals of the Bible. But these are things that I do as a minister as a person. Well, golly, I, I mean, I want to love my family. I want to love my friends. I want to understand my enemies so I can love them too. I want to help my friends understand my enemies so together we can walk safely in wisdom. I want to be a preacher of truth, but at times in media ministry, my voice feels like a hollow echo across, the, across a canyon of error. I want to carry the light into the darkness. Jesus changed my life, and he called me to this ministry. He did so in 1973, and he's still changing me because he loves me, and he has a plan for me. Some days it hurts to change, but everything that happens to me is for my good and God's glory. In fact, I think most everything calls me to live for two days. In that regard, I guess I'm very short-sighted. I want to be most short-sighted. I want to be the most short-sighted preacher that I know. I want my entire life to be concentrated on two days. And I believe this is also God's will for my life. And I believe I must tell you to change your concentration too. You see, I'm concerned that our Lord wants us to be aware and clear about knowing your purpose and his three rules about money. Let's start by allowing me to ask you a favor. I want you to think about the two most important days of your life. Now, think about them for a moment. Do you even know what those two days are? If not, I want to help you sort that out too. You see, it's important to know them so you can figure out the will of God for your life. And I promise before we conclude this program, you will also know God's three money rules. Now, these ideas may sound simple or even perhaps childish, but I believe they can revolutionize your faith and your fruitfulness. In case you missed the beginning of this series, let me take a quick minute to revisit the first two of God's money rules. Permit me to recount how a servant of God should make choices about life decisions and ministry projects where money is concerned. This is true for every believer. It 
you know, it goes back to God's money rule number one. It's never about the money. It's always about the decision. When we face a choice in life or in ministry, we must seek God. Our bank balances should not determine our answers. If we can easily afford a project, that does not ensure that we should take on a project. Conversely, if we cannot afford the cost of a particular project, that does not prove that the decision is not according to the will of the Lord. It might be God's will, but not His time. Or it might mean that God will provide in ways we had not expected. Now, certainly, our dependence should not be on our credit cards or credit lines. Our dependence must be on God alone. And I hope this all makes sense so far. But I got to tell you, I know it's too easy to get confused in life by what we can easily afford or what we cannot afford apart from the grace of God. And often we just think we know the difference. Allow me to reiterate an important aspect of this perspective. I want to make it clear for all people of faith in the Lord. If you can't afford to take a certain step of faith, your inability should not cause you to disobey the Lord. Your call from God is not based on your bank account. If the Lord calls you, He will equip you for the call. So don't let lack or abundance confuse you. You need to know the will of God for your life. You see, just because you cannot immediately afford to take certain steps, it does not mean that the steps are not part of God's plan for your life. And likewise, just because you can afford to make a certain decision, that is not always a good enough reason to make the affordable choice. You need to make your decisions based on whether or not the choice will please the Lord. If you know that the will of the Lord is clear about a certain matter, you must obey the Lord. He is well able to provide for the costs if He has directed the decision. Conversely, if you are pursuing a decision that is not according to the will of the Lord, even if you think you can afford it, God is equally well equipped to ensure that you can't afford it after all. Trust me, funds have a way of drying up or costs can escalate unexpectedly. Investments can tank, expensive stuff can break and require expensive repairs or crushing replacement costs. Or your money could be stored in a bag full of holes or a bank about to go under. I mentioned uh, this text from Haggai in, in an earlier portion of this series, and the Lord told His children to consider their ways, and I want you to consider your ways. It affects the results. I wrote a song when I was much younger, uh, called Consider Your Ways, and it's based on the words of this ancient Hebrew prophet Haggai. I'd like for you to take a listen. And uh, The fact that I was much younger does not mean that I was incorrect. I believe what I said then, and I believe it now. I hope you enjoy the song. Consider your ways, consider your ways. Have you gambled on a dream or dreamed your life away? Consider your ways, consider your ways. What's left on the bottom line at the end of your day? Consider your ways, consider your ways. Will they still work tomorrow? Did they work yesterday? Consider your ways, consider your ways. Will your pain still be with you when your riches fade away? Consider your ways, consider your ways. Are you going to live forever? Will you die someday? Consider 
your ways Consider your ways Please let his love lead you to eternal life today Consider your ways, consider your ways, consider his love, consider his pain, consider your ways, consider your ways. If you're gonna come to Jesus, consider to pray. God is good, he loves us, he has a plan for us, but we have to have an interest in pursuing that plan. We need to get about building his house. I'm glad that you stayed tuned. And I don't want us to get hung up on rule number one. It really serves herein to point us to rule number two. So once again, please allow me to repeat what I'd said to explain God's money rule number two, in case you missed it. I will do my best to make this worth your time. I learned an important lesson from God. He told me rule number two. Keep the main thing the main thing. Now, most of you may have learned that a long time ago. Nevertheless, this lesson was particularly painful and scary for me. You see, sometimes we get involved in good and intensely spiritual things that can still distract us from the plan of God. It doesn't mean that, you know, we're doing anything wrong. It just means that we might be involved in very good things that distract us from the very best things we should be doing. Good really is the enemy of great. I had to learn this the hard way. In my case, recently the Lord put my back against the wall. He sent me into the corner so that I could renew my focus. He wanted to help me keep the main thing, the main thing. Okay, now I think you know what I mean. This brings me to rule number three. And this one is the most important. And I still need to tell you, the two most important days of my life, they should be the two most important days in your life as well. Do you know what they are? Let me tell you something. I know mine. If the undertaker has his way, my tombstone will only show two dates. They will be the date of my birth and the date of my death. I visited my father's grave, may he rest in peace, at the Jewish cemetery. It's not a happy place. Like many graveyards and like many graves, most folks tend to focus on two dates. It seems to be very consistent. The two most important dates chosen by most folks seem wrong to me. I can't figure out why they are all focused on the date of their birth and the date of their death. I don't know anyone who recalls their birthday. And my expiration date will only be remembered by my survivors, so it doesn't do me much good. Now, how about some other days in our lives? Are you married? Well, forget your anniversary and you'll find out how important that date is. <laughs> I make a point of remembering February the 5th because I don't want it to be the latter date on my tombstone. Okay, so how about this? Are you a parent? Do you remember the day your child was born? They say that day changes your life forever. Well, I can attest to the fact that it does. But after six children, let me tell you that the day of their bar mitzvah, the day they graduate from college, or better yet, the day they get married and start paying their own bills. A date uh, that some of my viewers pray are one and the same. <laughs> Those things fill our hearts. And... Attending the marriage of a godly child to a godly spouse provides some of life's most memorable occasions. I can tell you from my experience that an even more meaningful day is when we watch a faithful grandchild celebrate a marriage to 
a spouse so they can begin serving the Lord together in a third generation of faith. By the way, God is good. And I must declare that all of our married children, along with those of our married grandchildren, are serving God. It is a powerful blessing to understand that each of them knows that God is their provider. But that hasn't answered the question. You've heard me speak of glorious days. You've thought about your memorable occasions. Can you answer me? Do you know the two most important days of your life? Let me ask you something. Are any of you great grandparents? I look forward with much anticipation to that soon coming day. By the way, I had the incredible privilege of being the best man at the wedding for one of my grandsons. It was such a blessing. I, I will never forget it. And I made it clear to him, to his wife, and to the entire assembly of those gathered for that auspicious occasion, I told them all that I was looking forward to sleeping with a great-grandmother. At that moment, I was only nine months away from greatness. And based on whenever those kids finally decide to make me great, uh, I'm going to be a great-grandparent someday. We, we all laughed uproariously. But you see, such days have left an indelible impression on my life. And now, many grandchildren later, I must tell you that it is easy to start losing track of birthdays, graduations, engagements, ordination ceremonies, and other numerous occasions that fill our lives with joy. Listen to me, friends. Whatever stage of life you might be living, whatever challenges you might be facing, God still wants each of us to keep our focus. He wants us to concentrate two days. Well, that's all for this episode. We're sorry that you have to leave, but we've learned a lot. In this episode, we learned the second rule of money, which is keep the main thing the main thing. Yeah, you got to know what the main thing is. You know, one thing that I think has is, is really been uh, impactful for us over the course of our years in Crosstalk is making sure that every dollar is spent uh, with direction from the Lord and that you're not wasting what God gives in resources. And I want to encourage you, make sure that you're not wasting the resources God gives you. Use them exactly how he calls you to use them and make sure that it's making an impact for the kingdom. Yeah, I would encourage you, stay tuned for the next episode of this series to find out what God's third rule of money is. If you missed the first two parts, follow us on social media at Crosstalk TV. We also post the full episodes on our YouTube with the same handle at Crosstalk TV. If you want to find encouragement throughout your day, our social medias are filled with plenty of things throughout the week that can uplift your life. We have things called truth capsules. I'll let you go figure out what that is. Yeah, I encourage you, if you uh, want to find any more information out, you can always go to our website, crosstalk.org. You can call us at 1-800-688-3422. And uh, until next time, shalom and God bless.